the first station, Jesus is judged. A reading from the Gospel of Mark. Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, called the Praetorium in Greek. And they called together the whole cohort, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. Jesus had been arrested the previous evening in the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives. Those who caused his arrest were unable to convict Jesus of any capital crime by their own laws. They were forced to bring him before the Roman governor on a charge of rebellion against the occupying power, Rome. Roman governor Pontius Pilate is uncomfortable with the whole situation. The crowd is unruly. The quiet dignity and calm assurance of the prisoner disturbs Pilate profoundly, but he is too weak to stand up to the crowd. Their shouts of crucify him become louder and louder Finally, the governor yields, and he sentences Jesus to death by crucifixion, the terrible death reserved for slaves, pirates, and rebels against the state. The governor orders him to be scourged first. Scourging consists of a beating with many thonged whip, each thong tipped with a metal pellet. The beating is administered as a grim kind of mercy to weaken the condemned man so as to shorten his suffering on the cross. Kings and queens in today's world wear crowns of gold, silver, and other precious metals set with diamonds, emeralds, rubies, and other precious stones. But the King of kings and Lord of lords, our King, wears a crown of thorns, a crown that pierces the skin, a crown that causes blood to flow. At the first station, we are confronted head on with a divine reversal. All the things we hold so dear, wealth, power, security, are replaced by a crown of thorns. Everything that seems to give us meaning in life, authority, prestige, our own self-importance is turned upside down by a crown of thorns. The second station, Jesus receives his cross. A reading from the Gospel of John. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. While they are waiting for those whom they will crucify to be brought from their cells, the soldiers in the execution detail idle the time away with a rough gambling game. They see Jesus as a condemned terrorist whose activities threaten their very lives. So they unhesitantly gamble for the privilege of tormenting him along the way with blows and words. When the condemned men appear, and there are three of them, each receives a single beam to carry across his shoulders to Golgotha. A placard declaring each man's crime will be carried in front of him. The death procession forms, and the order is given to move out through the crowded streets. In Jerusalem, the second station is at the Church of the Condemnation. Pilgrims stand on the beveled flagstones of an actual Roman road. This is one of the few places in Jerusalem where there is original Roman pavement on the Via Dolorosa one of the few places 
where Jesus placed his own feet that day. Most of the rest of the route of the Via Dolorosa is approximately 16 feet above the original path. Let us think about those 16 feet. Every single millimeter, every single inch of dirt on which the pilgrims walk includes dust from the shoes and tears from the eyes of pilgrims. We join with them in weeping for the prisoner condemned as the king of the Jews, despised and rejected, carrying so much more than a heavy, bruising, rough beam of wood. He is enduring the suffering that should have been ours, the pain that we should have borne. The third station, Jesus falls for the first time. A reading from the book of Isaiah. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. Jesus has walked from the Praetorium down the old transverse valley to the Tyropian Valley Road where he falls for the first time, pinned down by the weight of the crossbeam he is carrying. To see a strong young man in such a state is embarrassing, to say the least. Almost instinctively, we pass by on the other side, for this is a sight from which we hide our faces. Yet his meek acceptance of this humiliation and weakness is the mighty weapon with which he is disarming sin and suffering and death. Surely we are healed by the punishment he suffered, made whole by the blows he received. Jesus will fall three times during his walk to Calvary. God falls. God is not supposed to fall, but God does fall. Like the crown of thorns, this is a divine reversal Everything we hold so important, power, physical strength, is turned upside down. God becomes weak, no longer the all-powerful, but one who can fall, one who can die. God becomes human in the person of Jesus, and we confront the humanity of God in the act of Jesus falling. We too can fall we too can be weak. We too can be fully human. We are called on to help and lift up those who have fallen, to embrace the unlovable. For this is what Jesus does for us today as he is forced to carry his cross through the marketplace of Jerusalem. fourth station, Jesus meets his mother. A reading from the Gospel of Luke. 
This child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Jesus has fallen, and now he finds his mother coming forward to help. This is one station at which we all have something in common because we have all been mothered. At the other stations, we may have similar concerns, but at this station, our relationships with our own mothers provide a bond with Jesus as we reflect on his meeting his mother. We think about Jesus' mother, Mary, as she saw her son in agony and in pain and we lift up all mothers who have had to see their sons and daughters suffer. We know the tremendous pain of parents seeing their child in pain, seeing their child in any kind of agony. We know the pain of parents who see their children die. We also have the opportunity in this situation to lift up in our own prayers difficult times we may have had with our own mothers times when the relationship was not as we would have liked it to be, times when we have hurt our mothers, or times when our mothers have hurt us. At the same time, we lift up in thanksgiving times of joy and happiness that we have had with our mothers. As Jesus meets his mother, their love and joy in each other are whole and unblemished. They are one in their total obedience to the heavenly Father's will. The pain and sorrow of the sacrifice God asks of them now is almost overwhelming. Here at this station, we give thanks to all who have cared for us as we say, I'm sorry when I have hurt you. Help me to be more Christ-like in my relationships. Help me to wear a crown of thorns instead of demanding a crown of gold in my relationships. The fifth station, Simon of Cyrene helps Jesus carry the cross. A reading from the Gospel of Luke. As they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country, and they laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. Jesus is still unable to get to his feet so the officer in charge of the execution detail orders Simon of Cyrene, an African man who is visiting Jerusalem, to carry the crossbeam for him. Relieved of his burden, Jesus is just able to stand and to begin his climb to the city's gate. Have you ever stopped to consider how multi-ethnic the scriptures are? There's no reference in scripture to a person's skin color. We do not know the color of Simon of Cyrene's skin. We do not know if he was black, white, or olive-skinned. What we do know is that he came from the area of North Africa that is now called Libya. At the fifth station, we are given the opportunity to lift up our own prejudices to God, prejudices that stem from our own weaknesses, that make us less human because of the anxieties or fears that they provoke. We may become anxious when we encounter someone who has a different background than we do. We lift up and surrender our prejudices at this station so that we may be healed and live as Christ lived. We accept the invitation to turn upside down the biased value systems on which much of society is based. This station is another example of the divine reversal. 
May we remember that the biblical world is inclusive and that God loves all people and that all people are created in the image of God. May we live out with our hearts, minds, bodies, decisions, and behaviors that all people have the same equal status and equal unique value. The sixth station, Veronica wipes Jesus' brow. A reading from the book of Isaiah. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Now climbing the stairs of the Via Della Rosa, Jesus is almost unable to keep going. The strain and the exhaustion and the pain show on his face behind its mask of sweat, blood, and dust that almost blind him. From her home on the street, a woman sees Jesus approaching. In her compassion for his pain and suffering, she quickly dampens a towel and darts out of her house. Going between the guards, she wipes and cools his ravaged face. Later, she will discover an icon of that face marvelously imprinted on her towel. She will come to be known as Veronica. The word Veronica means true icon and icon image. God has sent his son the exact image of his own being. We too are created in the image of God. How well do we live in that image? We have often been poor representations of our maker, but now that the Son of God has been sent among us, we ourselves are called to be icons of God so that when others see us, they will see right through us to God and God's love. In her compassion, Veronica sees through the horror and the ugliness to the beauty of Jesus. She seems to know instinctively that it is the Lord who has made the punishment fall on him, the punishment all of us deserved. As the scripture takes Jesus from his judgment to his crucifixion, Veronica comes forward from our hearts to wipe the blood, sweat, and dust from his face. The seventh station, Jesus falls a second time. A reading from 1 Peter. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that free from sins we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. The sight of his mother, the aid of Simon, and Veronica's comfort have helped Jesus walk a little farther, but nothing can sustain the strength of this doomed prisoner for long. At the top of the Via Dolorosa, he falls for the second time. In Jesus' day, 
A city gate stood at the spot where the Via Dolorosa feeds into the original main road of Jerusalem, the Cardo. It was not unknown for Roman authorities to let the condemned get to this gate before granting them a pardon or commutation of their sentence. So the execution detail holds the procession here for a while. But Pilate has granted the one and only pardon this day to Barabbas. And Jesus knows this. There is no pardon for the supreme pardoner. No one in authority cares about his fate. Willingly, he gives himself to be wounded because of our sins. Jesus knows the way he is walking is irrevocable now. It is the way to his death. Even though Simon is carrying his cross, Jesus' energy is running out. His time is running out. The eighth station, Jesus talks to the weeping women. A reading from the Gospel of Luke. A great number of the people followed him, and among them were the women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when all will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Seeing that no last minute pardon is coming for any of their prisoners, the execution escort prepares to get the condemned men moving again. Realizing what this means, some women who have accompanied the procession begin to mourn and wail aloud. Their compassion is aroused by the sight of the beaten and abused men being driven or dragged to execution. But their compassion for Jesus is heightened by their own recognition that he is the innocent victim of the political machinations of their own leaders and of the representatives of the Roman occupying power. Jesus turns to them, daughters of Jerusalem, he says, do not weep for me. Jesus' death is not the accidental byproduct of contemporary politics. It is a deliberate act of self-giving. He tells the women of Jerusalem to weep not for him, but for themselves. And Jesus tells us not to weep for him, but to weep for ourselves in our injustices and in our cruelty. The ninth station, Jesus falls a third time. A reading from the book of Hebrews. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet is without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness 
so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. The execution procession has come out of the city gate into an area called Calvary. This is the unused quarry that Herod the Great made into a public place so people could see the executions and learn the dreadful lesson that crucifixions are intended to teach. But often passerbyers are indifferent. On that busy Passover Eve, how many people do you think really cared that another three men were going to be crucified? The Roman guard, the sentenced men carry their crosses and the crowd following the procession add congestion to the busy street when everyone is hurrying home. How often do we try to avoid those around us on a city street or even in church on Sunday? We are very busy. We have a lot to do in our important lives and we cannot take the time to stop and get involved in someone else's life. Someone who may need us just to listen to them for a moment. We fall whenever we pass by a person who needs us. Jesus has become the lamb about to be slaughtered, the sheep about to be sheared, and he never says a word. Though he, of the three sentenced to die, seems least able to withstand the pain and awful humiliation, he endures it humbly. He never says a word. How often have we passed indifferently by such a person? The tenth station, Jesus is stripped of his garments. A reading from the Gospel of John. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic, now the tunic was seamless, woven into one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they will cast lots. For Jesus, this is perhaps the most terrible moment in the whole appalling day. As a Jew, he has been taught never to be seen naked to be exposed to the curiosity of anyone and everyone passing by is one of the worst things that can happen. His humiliation, his degradation is virtually complete. Only the absolute helplessness of being stretched on the cross remains. We, the crowd, despise and reject him. To us, he now appears as nothing. So totally without dignity as a human being does he appear. Yet it is our degradation that he is bearing. He is stripped naked before us so that when we stand totally exposed for who and what we are before the ultimate judge, we shall not need to be ashamed. He is undergoing suffering that rightly should have been ours. We stop to think how often people strip other people of their dignity for their own gratification the many times that we have stripped other people of their dignity, of their human worth, just so we might feel a little better ourselves. We remember Jesus being stripped of his garments, and we offer up all of the times when we too have stripped other people. We ask God's forgiveness.
The eleventh station, Jesus is crucified. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. After the humiliation of nakedness, Jesus is subjected to the physical agony of having great spikes hammered through his wrists to stake his arms to the crossbeam on which he lies. The beam is then raised until it fits into its socket in the upright beam. Jesus hangs suspended from the spikes hammered through his wrists. A third great spike is driven through his ankles. Since every crucified person is labeled with a placard, Jesus's cross bears a placard reading, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. The Judean authorities do not like the wording, but Pilate, disgusted, insists that it remains as he has dictated. Members of the crowd jeer or are silently appalled. Jesus himself says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Those who hear him do not know that it is because of our sins that he is pierced and that we die with him on the cross. They do not know that nails are not what hold him to the cross, but rather his life-giving love for us. Three condemned men hang on their crosses slowly dying, but it is the man in the middle who holds everyone's attention, even that of his companions in agony. One of these joins the mockers in the crowd and screams insults at him. The other man protests and perhaps even to his own astonishment acknowledges that Jesus really is a king. Despite his own weakness and pain, Jesus turns his head towards this man saying, I promise you that today you will be in paradise with me. The twelfth station, Jesus dies on the cross. A reading from the Gospel of Mark. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtain from the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way, he breathed his last. He said, truly, this man was God's son. At Jesus' cross, a little band of grieving figures stands. To one of them, his mother, Jesus says gently, indicating the disciple whom he loves, he is your son. And to that youngest disciple, he says, she is your mother. Only then does he give some small sign of his own distress. I am thirsty, he says, and that distress deepens. And Jesus groans the prayer of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why do you abandon me? Death is not far from him now. The other two men are enduring their execution strongly, but Jesus is visibly weakening. Father, he whispers, into your hands 
I place my spirit. Suddenly his face changes. He cries out in a loud voice. It is finished. It is accomplished. All that the Father has sent me to do, I have accomplished. And he dies. The 13th station, Jesus' body is taken down from the cross. A reading from the Gospel of John. After these things, Joseph of Arathamea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed the body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices and linen clothes, according to the custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the day of Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. The experienced commander of the execution squad knows that he must give his prisoners the coup de grace and have their bodies removed before sundown. He orders his men to break the legs of the crucified men. To the commander's surprise, Jesus seems already dead, but he insists on confirming the fact by thrusting his spear into Jesus' side. As the bodies are about to be taken down and thrown into a mass grave, two local dignitaries arrive with an order from the governor, allowing them to remove Jesus' body and to bury it privately. The two, Joseph and Nicodemus, remove the iron spikes, and lower Jesus' bloody, grimy, sweat-caked body into the arms of his mother and the tiny band of watchers. Do any of them remember what he said only the night before? This is my body given for you. This is my blood poured out for you. Countless millions will hear those words someday and remember, but the future is hidden from the mourners at this moment. By now, it is too late in the day to complete the preparation of Jesus' body for burial before Sabbath begins. Therefore, the body is taken to the nearby tomb owned by Joseph. Now it awaits preparation for proper burial before Sabbath. For Jesus, all of the suffering and all of the pain is over. All the words that could be spoken have been spoken. Now we are left with silence. Now we are left with our inmost thoughts. And now we are left with the words of the centurion, truly, this man was the Son of God.
The 14th station, Jesus' body is placed in the tomb. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. He then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. In the great church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, there's a small building called the Empty Tomb. What other church, what other cathedral, what other basilica in the world hosts an empty tomb? None other does. Such a church is only found in Jerusalem. Our roots stem from this empty tomb. This empty tomb makes sense of our lives, and the empty tomb gives meaning and purpose to our lives. But at this moment, Jesus has been laid in the tomb. We remember this time of darkness, doubt, and fear. As we recognize that we have killed God, we can only pray, Lord, have mercy.